What's up, my fellow ghostly goonies? On tonight's episode, we talk some recent UFO stuff, a new Mandela Effect study, some spooky stuff, and all our regular segments, including Chris Whitehouse of the White House Investigation Team and horrible reviews with Ed Brave Dave, so look out! Do aliens exist and are they among us? Are weird creatures lurking in the darkness? Do evil entities hide in the shadows of your bedroom while you sleep? Join us as we explore all this and more on the Warped Reality Podcast. <laughs> What's going on, everybody? Welcome to episode 21 of the Warped Reality Podcast. I can't believe I've been doing this for this long. It's pretty crazy. Um, I am so excited that it is spooky season right now. As the time of your hearing this, it is the middle of October, so Halloween is only a short two weeks away. The one thing I am super excited about that at the time of recording this has not taken place yet is the new Halloween movie that's coming out, Halloween Ends. I am really looking forward to that movie, guys. I have to see that in the movie theater. I'm not streaming it. I got to see it there. You know, um, I've never been a huge Halloween fan. It's always been about Jason and Friday the 13th and Freddy Krueger and stuff, but this is a, a landmark film. Let's let's say that, you know, Jamie Lee Curtis is plugging the hell out of this thing and I'm sure it's going to be great. I just don't know where they're going to go with it. Is is he going to die? Is he going to get away at the end? Is he going to kill everybody in the town? What is going to happen? I am super excited about it and I'm super excited about this show. So let's get on with some out of this world news. So the office of the director of national intelligence for aviation made a little boo-boo it seems that they mistakenly posted a new logo on their website with a few fighter jets flying over the u.s and a ufo a spokesperson for the agency had said that it was erroneous erroneously posted and was unofficial and incorrect it also appeared that one of the planes pictured was that of a russian military aircraft I can't see how this occurrence could be made by error. I mean, it's sure, if you see the seal, uh, it's like a, a quite a large cartoon-looking UFO on it, which was pretty funny. Um, it was probably a joke that someone did, and now they're probably looking for a new job. But uh, also, a new UFO exhibit is coming to Ari the Arizona Boardwalk in Scottsdale this fall. It's called UFO Experience. The truth is out there. And it's going to be a family-friendly exhibit showing the history and allure of UFOs. It's going to feature over 200 artifacts, film clips, and recordings that claim to show evidence of extraterrestrials dating back a millennia. Uh, it's, it's also going to showcase a simulation of an alien abduction, uh, minus the probes, hopefully, and many interactive elements. It's, oh boy. It's scheduled to open this month, so if you're going to be in the Scottsdale area of Arizona, check it out. So the next thing I wanted to talk to you guys about was also something to do with UFOs. It I had just recently visited uh, this awesome place called the Pine Bush UFO and Paranormal Museum in Pine Bush, New York. It's located in Orange County, uh, a little bit upstate, a little bit uh, further north than New York City. The museum recently opened last spring. And it's a great place to visit, guys. Uh, I'm not getting paid to do this. I, I enjoyed it thoroughly. Uh, they have self-guided tours as well as guided tours showing you different video clips, evidence, case studies, and UFO models from eyewitness accounts. They also had a great section on Bigfoot accounts as well as an awesome haunted paranormal shack with cursed or haunted items. That was my favorite area, of course. My tour guide, John, was awesome. He was very informative, realistic, and thorough with his knowledge of the subject matter. He was so thorough, so thorough, that the 90-minute tour lasted almost three hours. It was well worth the money and my time. I absolutely loved it. They have many Halloween events going on this month, so I encourage you to check them out if you're in the area. In the near future, I'm going to have John on the show as he is part of MUFON and a paranormal investigator with tons of great stories. Lance, uh, the owner of the museum, 
was very cool as well. I'm definitely going to have him on as well. I'm sure he's got some stories of his own. And the lady at the front desk, I didn't catch her name, was extremely nice. Great place. Great people. I'll leave the link in the show notes. So if you're in the area, please go and check them out. They are awesome. And now let's get on to some spooky news. So Lexi Chindister out in California thought that she may be experiencing a true horror movie staple when she realized that her walls were bleeding. Shit, that's some serious Amityville stuff right there. She posted a video on her Instagram showing this anomaly, and it's since been viewed over 6 million times. She consulted with plumbers and other professionals uh, so she could see what the hell is going on, but her search was coming up with nothing. Nobody was able to figure out what was going on. People on Instagram were leaving her comments like, it's time to move and you need to leave. Satan is coming for you. Uh, that's, that's nice to make, make people feel better. Internet. Thank you. So it turns out that it was no Amityville house that she had found out that the culprit was rust inside the cabinet that had liquefied due to steam and condensation from the room. And it was leaking through the wall or leaking through the cabinet, creating this red blood looking substance. And, uh, yeah, it's, that's pretty crazy. I, I would, probably be pretty freaked out as well how about you has anything like this ever happened to you or have your walls ever actually bled well you could let me know about it at 845-600-0744 leave me a message uh if you run out of time call back and resume you could do so anonymously all right so we've talked about the mandela effect before in season one but there was a new study that was conducted regarding the false memory phenomenon. A quick definition of this is, is that it's like a false memory shared by a large mass of people, remembering certain aspects of things, but that they apparently never were. For example, the Monopoly guy with his top hat, cane, and monocle, but he never had a monocle. Anyway, this study presented people with three versions of the same icon. One was correct and two were manipulated, and they asked them to select the correct one. There were 40 sets of icons, and they included C-3PO from Star Wars franchise, the Fruit of the Loom logo, and the Monopoly Man from the board game. In the results, which had been accepted for publication in the Journal of Psychological Sciences, they found that people fared very poorly on seven of them, only choosing the correct one around or less than 33% of the time. For these seven images, people consistently identified the same incorrect version, not just randomly choosing one of the two incorrect versions. In addition, Participants reported being very confident in their choices and having high familiarity with these icons despite being wrong. Even after being told which image was the right one, later on the people still picked the wrong one. So basically the study proved that they can't prove why people are remembering these false memories and they really have no scientific explanation. If you want to hear a more in-depth explanation along with many examples please check out my fellow podcaster chappie's episode about it on his podcast paranormal stories parentheses spooky shiz i'll put a link in the show notes of the episode while you're at it check out all of his other episodes as well and now we're going to check in with chris whitehouse of the white house investigation team where he talks about protection no no not that kind of protection get your minds out of the gutter okay this is a family podcast. Hi, uh, some of you might know that I run a ghost team over in the UK and I wanted to talk about protection. I get asked a lot about how do you protect yourself on investigations, especially as we use the Ouija board every time. We always have um, for 11 years and I would say never had the experiences that I read about and I think that might be down to protection. But along with protection, I would also put intention. When you read a bad stories about the Ouija board, you will normally hear the words, we were messing about. So the intention was bad. And I do believe spirits know your intentions, which is why we always approach in a very respectful manner. and We don't ever provoke. I think psychology 
plays a huge amount in this game and also the power of belief can make the evening go well or not so well. Protection in and of itself is something that you do to stop spirits following you home which of course nobody really wants. So on the plus side protection could be maybe a prayer if that's what you're into some other little ritual you do, you, you sage yourself, you know, you cover yourself in the smoke massage. Anything that you believe in, really, because the power of belief uh, is important. As long as you think you've done something that works, that's better than not. Now, we use the white light method. It changes in description, but basically we are covering ourselves in white light in some way, be it an energy is imagined to be drawing a shield around us, whether we imagine ourselves stepping into white clothes, covering ourselves completely. There's some sort of a mental ritual that we do and then also undo at the end of the evening. We step out of our protection back to the normal world, if you like. This protection of whatever you're choosing opens you up makes you in the right mindset, helps you focus, it switches you on to what the job is at hand. And likewise, you switch off at the end. You close the door on the spirits. And you need that mental faculty to stay in control, which is also a very psychological thing. If you wander into, into a church with a Ouija board or a cemetery with a Ouija board and you're thinking, oh my God, this is so wrong but so fun, we're going to, you know, rile up some evil spirits, then that's what your psychology will deliver, no, probably, you know? Whereas um, we approach in a very calm, neutral, we want to talk to spirits, friendly spirits. And the ones that do come through and don't seem friendly are more mischievous. And rather than running... We just say, come on now, just be right with us. We're here to be right with you. And every time, pretty much, they calm down and they reveal some immature, harmless soul behind it who's just been a bit of a nuisance. They're just people. But yes, we discovered our protection through going on our first ghost hunts and just copying what those experienced teams did. And then, in our own way, We decided to try other things, half the team protected and half not, not doing protection at all. And we experimented and found quite often protection amplifies activity. And when we experimented with not doing it, we'd often get nothing at all. No evidence, no movement of the board or anything at all. And then we'd switch it back on just to sort of experiment for the last quarter of an hour and a spirit would come through and say you lot go home I'm protecting you from all this stupid stuff you're doing from other spirits and it's time for you to go so I think if you want activity you should do protection but I'm happy to hear other people's results because I can only go by what my team have found but I think for anyone who's new to intermediate do protection because things naturally do fall over at home or something might happen that you will then attribute to being paranormal when it completely isn't. You need to have that switch to think, well, no, I did protection, so I'm just being stupid because I know nothing's followed me home, and that will give you strength. So I advise protection, but then I come to the cons of protection. How could it work if we shield ourselves from spirit How do we then ask them to come into our circle, affect the board, touch us, and just influence the environment? I thought a shield keeps them away. That would make it impossible. So it's very contradictory. I just picture this spirit looking at this shield I've created in my mind's eye and going, what the hell am I supposed to do with that? That's nothing. Is that supposed to stop me? What, what's the magical aspect of that that means I can't just follow you home? I have had spirits follow me home and they've proved to me by telling me later on a board what they did, where they were. I, can, I think you can also think it doesn't work. The argument could definitely be made for that. But I still think you should do it. 
and that would be my advice. Do it is better than not doing it. Create a mental process that switches you on and then switch you off at the end. Well, that's all for this week. Now back to the podcast. Thank you, as always, Chris. Very informative. I definitely uh, agree with Chris on all of that. Please protect yourself if you're ever going to go on a ghost investigation or anything like that. But the one thing that he did say that actually struck a chord with me was that he had said that a lot of it has to do with intention, uh, you know, bringing in these bad spirits and stuff. And that is exactly what Carl Johnson had said, uh, demonologist Carl Johnson, in episode nine of season one. He had said that the Ouija board and even watching a scary movie could bring something evil into your household if it's your intention or if you're thinking about it too much to where, you know, it's it's really messing with your mind. It really could happen. It's it's a your mind is a crazy thing. And you don't want any of that. So watch a movie. Take it with a grain of salt. It's a movie, right? Except for the Jeffrey Dahmer thing, because that was real and that was that was pretty effed up, right? And now for some I read it on Reddit, posted by Bigfoot Samurai. Uh, this one's entitled Native Father's Encounter with Small People. A sort of follow-up to a post about my native grandmother's encounter with a giant owl. This is about my native dad. Instead, as he has had a few supernatural things happen to him and the rest of the family in Oklahoma, my father would frequently encounter small little people no bigger than a pine cone called minipeds. His go-to story about the minipeds was when he was around 10 years old, he would go fishing in the lake near his childhood home. My grandpa would take him sometimes, but when he was at work or getting treatment in Oklahoma City, he would go alone. The thing about the lake and creeks in the area were that the mists that would roll in were not too high, only about a foot off the ground, if not less, and would cover most of the area for hours at a time. This particular time, he went out fishing. He got closer and closer to the misty edge of the lake. As he approached, he would hear voices. He originally thought it was the wind, but walking further along the path, he realized it was voices. Nothing he could recognize or understand, but definitely dozens of small little voices around him. Feeling a bit frightened, he made his way back home where his grandmother was home as well at the time. He told her about it, and she just told him everything was okay. Those voices were mini pets. And as long as you didn't bother them, they won't bother you. In fact, if you should get lost at the lake, they could even help you try and get home. Still scared, he didn't go fishing that day. The next morning, however, he had all but forgotten about the encounter and set off to go fishing again. Going down the same old path he always went down, he again noticed the mist a foot above the ground and again small little voices. Keeping in mind what Grandma said about not bothering him, not bothering them, he just kept about his business and made it to the edge of the lake. The voices died down a bit and he was able to enjoy fishing in peace. He said he fished for a good two hours or so before heading back home and along the path he again heard the voices. This time, however, along the misty path, he would see it move left and right, as if something small under it was moving quickly and moving the mist in the process. He rarely saw a miniped, but the few times he did see them before moving to Texas, he said they were human-like, with gray skin or brown skin, and only a few inches tall. When he encountered them again as an adult, he was fishing with my uncle on my mother's side. They went fishing pretty often when I was growing up, five times every summer it seemed. They either went to one of the lakes in the Panhandle area of New Mexico or, of course, Oklahoma. The one time they went to Oklahoma, they went to the lake close to the one he grew up in, only 50 or so miles west. They set to get on a boat that my uncle had owned to fish on the lake, but on the way there, there was a mist, of course, and the sound of little voices. My dad thought nothing of it, but my uncle was starting to get confused, asking if my dad heard the voices in the wind. He told him not to worry and that they were just minipeds, and if you didn't bother them, then they wouldn't bother you. Eventually, it freaked my uncle out too much, and he convinced my dad to go fish at a lake back west in Texas. He didn't see any 
that time, and I have had yet to see one myself. Probably because any time we visited family, it was in Oklahoma City, and we never went to a lake or anything. At least, not any I visited, I remember. I do hope to encounter them, though. I mean, if my dad believes they exist, even into adulthood, then maybe they do exist. What do you think? Native nonsense or plausible creature yet to be discovered? You see, everybody, here at the Warp Reality Podcast, we don't discriminate against ghosts, aliens, Bigfoot, or little people. We're just not that kind of podcast. So right now we're going to check in with Edgegrave Dave on a horrible review. Now, this one's going to be a little bit different, guys. This one isn't a horror movie, um, as you may think it might be. It is about a mascot of one of our favorite bands. And I think you're going to find the subject matter and the history of it very, very informative and quite awesome. Hey, listen, guys, this is what you get when you have metalheads running a podcast, all right? So but check it out. It's awesome. Take it away, Edgegrave. Horrible review Edgegrave Dave. Hey, what's up, fellow grave diggers? Edgegrave Dave here. You know, I've been a metalhead for most of my life on this planet, and a lot of the bands I love, I've shared the listening experience with Ghost Joe, actually as well as having the pleasure to sing while he played wicked guitar. In our early days of our youths as kids, we would totally geek it out and play air guitar, portraying many of our idols. On today's segment, we're going to talk about one of the most legendary faces of a metal band, literally the face of Iron Maiden, Eddie, or as he's also known, Eddie the Head. This gruesome mascot is really something to behold. He's awesome. As he not only serves as the mascot, he's also the symbol and embodiment, visually speaking, of this legendary band. Man, I could talk for hours until the end of days about how musically awesome and epic this founding father of the metal genre's band is, but we're going to focus on Eddie itself. Starting out as a paper mache mask used as a stage prop, the artist Derek Riggs fleshed him out as a human zombie-like creature who changes themes with each album, symbolizing the album's atmosphere, storytelling, and even tours. He's been used on everything from all aspects of merchandise, including t-shirts and toys, to the very highlight of the stage itself, with the current version of the creature coming out to walk over 10 feet tall. He would do both entertaining and hilarious antics, both to the band members and to the fans, while they performed. One memorable prop, and perhaps one of the coolest, was a 30-foot mummified version of the creature from 1984 to 1985's World Slavery Tour for the album Power Slave, which shot sparks from its very eyes. Eddie has been everything from the representation of a fan with long hair and a biker jacket to a mummy, cyborg, alien, spooky tree-like creature, a zombie crawling out of the grave, a soldier, and even the current dead samurai on 2021's Shenzitsu album. Many other bands have borrowed elements from Eddie throughout the years, but Eddie's appearance remains a unique, recognizable staple fans and even casual people who just heard of the band know. The artwork does not come without some controversy, however, as one of the first depictions of the character was standing over the dead body of then Prime Minister Margaret Thatcher, a 1980s Sanctuary single for the debut self-titled record Iron Maiden. Another version was him controlling the devil in 1982's The Number of the Beast, an awesome album which I recommend for everybody. And this is the time period where people, especially back then in the 1980s and in the United States, branded Iron Maiden as Satanists. This was actually a common problem that other bands had as well, like Ozzy and believe it or not, even Kiss. As a young teen, I couldn't get enough of the creature, and I used to even send away for mail order t-shirts. Remember those from the 90s? I would collect magazines and hang them or rather scotch tape the pages to my bedroom wall. Uh, My parents probably wanted to kill me for stripping the paint. (laughs) Eddie never took anything away from the dual guitar sound, memorable hooks and choruses that would get locked in your brain with incredible vocals. And I truly mean this with all three singers and in every era of the band. I highly recommend checking out perhaps Power Slave or The Number of the Beast 
to start your journey with this incredible band. Also, Bruce Dickinson's vocals really shine here with, with the lyrics. I mean, they just really capture the sound. The, the guitar work alone will keep you humming along while the image of Eddie is tattooed into your soul. I also wanted to mention that as a father, I couldn't be prouder of uh, taking my eight-year-old daughter to see them in New Jersey with the spectacle of the show that they perform. You know, raising kids is really a privilege. So sit back, grab a brew of choice, turn down the lights, turn up some Iron Maiden aces high and two minutes to midnight in your golden years. There won't be any fear in the dark. Uh, see what I did there? Now back to you, Ghost Joe. Thank you, Dave, for that awesome segment on Eddie the Head. I wonder who would win in a fight. Do you think it would be Eddie the Head or Megadeth's Vic Rattlehead, who is also quite an intimidating figure? Or do you think it would be Metallica's Bloody Semen Splatter from the Load Albums? I wonder. That would be a good matchup, wouldn't it? Anyways, thanks a lot, Edgegrave. See you next time. Can't wait for the next one. All right, so now, now let's buy a ticket to the Cryptid Zoo, and we'll talk about the Thunderbird. So the Thunderbird is a flying cryptid, obviously, whose wingspan ranges from 8 feet to 160 feet, according to some witnesses. That is quite a large gap. I don't know how you would be able to tell 160 feet uh, from the air, but hey. Uh, it gets its name from Native American legend of being so large that the flaps of their wings would cause thunder. It's usually described as being very reptilian-like, uh, typically dark brown or black. Some say it could be a pterosaur, which supposedly went extinct 66 million years ago. But there have been fossils of the pterosaur found in the area of some of these Thunderbird sightings, mainly around the U.S. and Canada. The first sighting was reported in 1890 by two men who claimed to have spotted this giant creature and shot it. Another sighting was in September of 1977. Two large birds with wingspans of approximately 8 feet were sighted in Lonsdale, Illinois, and one of them even attempted to pick up a child, but then had to put it down shortly after. These mythical creatures may also have been confused with some eagles and other more common large birds like the California condor. There are some quite, quite big eagles out there, guys. Um, if, if you've ever seen uh, some YouTube videos or if you've ever seen them in person, you know, or if you've ever seen a Thunderbird in person, please give me a call at 845-600-0744 and leave me a voicemail. And now it's time for some haunted eBay. The first item we got is haunted clown doll. Beware colrophobia. That's the fear of clowns, if you didn't guess. Dark, strong, paranormal energy, evil. The current bid is $41, and the shipping is $19, coming all the way from Southington, Connecticut, in the U.S. Haunted clown doll, beware. Zeb can be quite evil and cruel. He has been acting out a lot recently and hurting other vessels I have in my home. I have had to put him in time out from time to time when this happens. His vessel must be bound and blindfolded when he misbehaves or he just gets worse. I need to send him off to someone who has the patience to deal with him and his antics. I inherited him and can't handle him anymore. Beware if you have children in the home. He will teach them to act out. My daughter absolutely loves him and when he is in timeout she gets furious i can't keep him around any longer please note that he is extremely old and with time his vessel's arm has been torn i think it happened when his original owner and he wouldn't let go of something if you have any questions please message me so the next item is haunted doll succubus kelsey 15 years old and it goes for $65. Shipping is $12.50, coming from Aurora, Illinois. Seller assumes all responsibility for this listing. Aged 15, Kelsey looked 
like a very sweet young girl, but she switched boyfriends more often than people switched underwear. She loved dating guys about 10 years older than she was. That's illegal. Kelsey was looking for sex and to get taken care of. Usually, she would get you to start buying her things, starting with smaller things, gradually gradually going up in value, then having sex. Kelsey is super sexually forward. She would get horny to the point of it being unbearable and hard or impossible to turn off. She will throw herself at you when you are not expecting it. Like, like the doll will throw itself at you? Is that what? Anyway, she will sit on your lap, start moving her hips, grinding on you, and tell you, come with me. She is hot and experienced. Don't wait. Doll is 17 inches tall. I am required as per eBay's policy on the paranormal to indicate that eBay forbids the sale of intangible items, blah, 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 entertainment purposes only. So, so I guess you, you, you have sex with, with a doll. I mean, I mean, there's people that have sex with dolls, but this is like, like a children's like small doll. Like, I don't know. Anyway, on, 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 on to the next item, shall we? And the last item we have here on Haunted eBay is Beware, Real Haunted and Cursed Object. This cross is made of real bones. Look. The price is $1,200. The shipping is $30. And it's coming from Watertown, Wisconsin. A very scary crucifix cross made of real bones. This item was used in seances and more. Very rare and unusual. Made of chicken or turkey bones, used for dark arts, and is indeed very active. Warning, it does have at least three entities attached to it. So, I mean, when you say it was made of real bones, like, I mean, everybody kind of assumed, you know, like, like, like human bones, right? I mean, at least, at least like, like a domestic animal bones, but. I mean, chicken or turkey bones, uh, I have those in my refrigerator right now. I don't think they're very haunted, though. But anyway, that's my segment, Haunted eBay. And that's going to do it for this episode of the Warped Reality Podcast. I hope you guys enjoyed it. Uh, Stay tuned for the next episode of the Warped Reality Podcast. It's the Halloween episode. It comes out Saturday, October 29th. And I hope to have a lot of real spooky stuff planned for you guys for that show. Possibly even an interview that I just recently did with some very, very interesting guys. I know you're going to love that interview when I put it out, so I'm going to try and put that out there on the Halloween episode. If not, it'll be in the near future as well. So that's it, everybody. Have a great night. And you know what? Don't forget to change your shorts, all right? Thank you for listening to the Warp Reality Podcast. And thank you to all my guests and contributors that helped make this show possible. For more episodes, guest info, social media links, merch, and more, please check out WarpRealityPodcast.com. If you have a paranormal experience you would like to share, questions, comments, or you'd like to be a guest on the show, please leave me a voicemail at 845-600-0744. Or you can email me at ghostjoeny at gmail.com. You can do so anonymously if you'd like. Also, I'd greatly appreciate it if you could leave me a review on Apple Podcasts or WorkRealityPodcast.com. Have a great night, everyone, and don't forget to change your shorts.